Last paper, I'm going to do something a little novel. Dr. Levy has to catch a flight, so the discussion's going to go before the talk. See how that goes. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, but. <laughs> Thank you. One of the, the issues that, that we have with trauma, and specifically with regard to penetrating injury in children, is that it just isn't sexy. Brain tumors are sexy, vascular malformations are sexy, but, but head trauma, and specifically pen, penetrating trauma, has never been sexy. Um, over 20 years ago, working at USCLA County Hospital, um, it was Mike Apuzzo who actually pushed us in the direction of, of uh, determining outcomes and looking at the potential for outcome in patients with gunshot wounds because nobody else was interested in addressing such, and the population we were seeing was so much different. One of the issues that we have is, is at USC at that time, um, it was a freestanding hospital that also would take kids, women, uh, and so we were able to see a varied assortment of patients of all ages. Um, one of the difficulty with current hospitals, uh, specifically the freestanding children's hospitals, is we don't have the exposure to the older patients because a large proportion of these patients are usually anywhere from 14 to 18, and those are patients we just don't get at our hospitals. And not that that's necessarily a problem, but it's problematic for papers and discussion when you're trying to look at outcome. The purpose that we used for looking at outcome is we had an eight-bed ICU, we had no resources, and we developed two models, a logistic model looking at life versus death and a linear regression analysis looking at outcome. And based upon that model, we would either put somebody in our ICU or send them to the ward. We didn't have a step down and there wasn't a lot in between. Um, of those 60 patients uh, with Glasgow coma scores of three, four, and five, I remember the two that did well. One was a three and one was a four. Um, and that was always problematic despite the fact that our model was very predictive. Uh, I think the authors of this paper have done something that absolutely needed to be done, which is take those variables that were utilized by all of the papers in the past. They took our variables, interventricular hemorrhage, or specifically a bihemispheric transventricular uh, injury, uh, injury of the third ventricle, multiple lobes, Glasgow coma score, pupillary response, and refined all of this, looked at their own numbers, and were able to put it in a predictive model of outcome that I think is very appropriate and necessary. Uh, it's always a problem with a retrospective approach to studies, but, but I think that that's where you need to start with these type of injuries uh, as you move into the realm of predicting outcome and then basing your treatment on what your prediction is and almost making it into a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, I applaud the authors for their efforts and, and thought that they had done a wonderful job. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Dr. Bant, the last talk. Management of pediatric intracranial gunshot wounds, predictors of favorable outcome, and proposed treatment paradigm from WashU. Thank you. And just remember the, the mats and lectures uh, Wednesday at 2 o'clock, so just keep that in mind and come back to Dr. Pomeroy's talk. Evening. Thanks for sticking around for the last talk of the afternoon. My name is Katie Bant. I'm a fourth year neurosurgery resident at WashU in St. Louis, and I'll be talking about the management of pediatric intracranial gunshot wounds and predictors of favorable clinical outcome. I have nothing to disclose. Brief overview of my talk, uh, an introduction into why we started asking, thinking about this and asking this question, what our hypothesis going into the project was how we designed our study protocol and uh, go through, um, briefly touch on the individual radiographic feature and clinical criteria that we evaluated and the findings for each. And then a proposed new treatment paradigm we termed the St. Louis scale for pediatric gunshot wounds to the head and some conclusions we've drawn from our preliminary study and where we should go from here. Brief introduction, there has been a dramatic increase in civilian gun violence since the late 1980s. This has been attributed to um, a laxening of civilian gun laws and an increased use of cocaine in the 80s and 90s. Uh, currently, in the last decade to 15 years, this has tapered back off uh, to, to what it was before that increase, but certainly continues to be a significant problem in large urban, uh, large urban communities. And uh, most notably, with regard to the pediatric population, the highest proportional increase has unfortunately occurred within the pediatric population, affecting um, most significantly the young African American and Hispanic male communities, with a threefold increase in African American male uh, victims and twofold, in, uh, excuse me, age 13 through 17, and a twofold increase in African American males age 18 through 24. 
Currently, no definite treatment paradigm exists for the pediatric, uh, for victims of pediatric gunshot wounds to the head, uh, excuse me, pediatric victims of gunshot wounds to the head. Uh, the adult criteria are frequently uh, extrapolated to the pediatric population, and the, sort of one of the more foundational papers addressing these, uh, these variables was Dr. Benzel's paper in 1991 highlighting bihemispheric involvement, course through the geographic center of the brain, a transventricular trajectory, multiple lobes involved, although no, no definite criteria as to is it two or three, et cetera, um, and both mixed infra and supertentorial involvement. Uh, there, there currently is a dearth of existing literature regarding predictive factors for survival or good outcomes specific to the pediatric population, and uh, we sought to fill that void with this project. Our hypothesis going into the study was that the pediatric population is unique in their ability to compensate for an intracranial insult, and therefore more aggressive management paradigm may benefit these victims uh, than um, uh, would otherwise be considered in the adult population. I'll, I'll start where it might seem somewhat intuitive to finish, and that is with our outcome scale. And the reason I do that is to highlight the fact that of our survivors, most had very good outcome scale, um, outcome scores. Um, the, the teal color here is, um, how does this work here? The teal quadrant represents normal um, Glasgow, well, thank you. Glasgow outcome um, score of five here, uh, purple representing um, minimal disability, Glasgow outcome score of four, able to live independently and return to school or work, and then this smaller uh, wedge representing um, dependent or, uh, or severe disability. I'll point out also that we had um, zero patients recover to a persistent vegetative state, so of our survivors, most are doing quite well. Methodology for this study included a retrospective review of all victims of intracranial gunshot wounds age 18 years or younger treated at St. Louis Children's Hospital or the adjacent Barnes Jewish Hospital between 2002 and 2011. We had an N of 48, and we looked uh, at the predictive value of those previously mentioned adult clinical and radiographic factors for poor prognosis, uh, specifically as they pertain to the pediatric population. Findings, this, this is a bit of a busy slide here, but I'll point out that these were the variables that we looked at here. The admission GCS, mixed supertentorial versus infra, supertentorial, infratentorial versus mixed uh, involvement, unilateral versus bilateral injury, transventricular trajectory, number of lobes involved, pupillary exam on arrival, systolic blood pressure on arrival, involvement of the deep nuclei and or third ventricle, of course, as able to be assessed by CT. Um, presence of midline shift, and then an initial ICP when it was available. Uh, the two at the top here were sort of statistically difficult to, to um, incorporate. Uh, the admission GCS, unfortunately, the statistically relevant cutoff uh, was less than or equal to 13, which, of course, clinically is not particularly relevant. Um, and then the supra versus infratentorial versus mixed compartmental involvement uh, was, was not overtly statistically significant, but our numbers were pretty small there. So um, both of those were a little bit difficult to incorporate. But uh, beginning with each individual um, uh, criteria, just to go through the data. Uh, so admission GCS, you'll see that we had zero patients present with a GCS between 9 and 12, uh, there, thereby leading to that uh, statistically significant but clinically irrelevant, less than or equal to 13 cutoff. Uh, but I'll also point out that we had five patients uh, come in with GCS seven or less that went on to make good recovery. Supertentorial versus infratentorial involvement. We had no isolated infratentorial involvement and only eight mixed supra and infratentorial um, involvement. So numbers there were somewhat small, but certainly of those who did have mixed involvement, uh, it appears as if uh, significantly uh, associated with poor prognosis there, but our numbers were weak to make that a reliable, um, reliable variable. By hemispheric involvement, uh, typically uh, considered to be prognostic for poor prognosis, I'll point out we had five patients with bi bilateral involvement that made good, good outcomes. Transventricular trajectory, as expected, most patients uh, uh, 
succumb to their injuries, but one uh, with transventricular trajectory did not. Number of lobes involved here, uh, I'll point out that we had quite a few patients with more than one lobe involved that went on to make a good recovery, and our statistical cutoff was three or more, but that uh, two lobes involved was, was not to be uh, universally considered uh, a dismal prognostic factor. Involvement of the deep nuclei and or third ventricle, again, as able to be assessed by initial CT, uh, was certainly significant for, um, for poor prognosis. ICP, we didn't monitor all of our patients, and, and as we go forward, it, it might be something we consider doing in the future, because it certainly appears that there's a significant cutoff point uh, somewhere between 30 and 44. Um, you, you'll see here that there's, there's a pretty big gap there between 30 and 44, but there certainly appears to be a clinical correlation between uh, initial ICP, as we would certainly expect. Uh, we need more robust numbers to know exactly what that number is, but I think it might be a useful prognostic factor, a quick procedure that could be done in the emergency department uh, for initial assessment and uh, prognostic purpose. Initial pupillary exam, bilateral fixed pupils were 100% correlated with death. Uh, and unilateral fixed, um, more, more evenly distributed, as you would expect. Admission systolic blood pressure here, a trend towards significance with systolic blood pressure greater than 100 um, on arrival. Presence of midline shift was, was only a weak prognostic factor. And other systemic injuries, I include this just to point out that these really were typically isolated injuries uh, to the head and with, with very few concomitant thoracic or abdominal or other associated systemic injuries. I'll, I'll skip over this. It's a little bit, uh, a little bit busy, and I think the next slide just depicts uh, our findings a little bit better. Um, three variables came up as 100% correlated with death, uh, that being bilateral fixed pupils on initial, on initial physical exam, involvement of the deep nuclei or third ventricle, and an initial ICP greater than 30 when that was available. Three more were, were, were notably um, high, but not, not as dramatically high as 100%. Uh, mixed supra and infratentorial involvement, um, transventricular trajectory, and three or more lobes involved were also notably associated with uh, poor prognosis. And then the final three, by hemispheric involvement, systolic blood pressure less than 100 on arrival in the presence of midline shift more, more weakly associated with poor prognosis. This led to the proposal of a new uh, treatment um, grading scale or treatment paradigm, which is a, a weighted um, scale with primary predictive criteria, secondary predictive criteria, and tertiary predictive criteria, uh, dividing up our nine variables um, for their strength of correlation with poor versus good prognosis. Um, primary predictive criteria, uh, three points credited for each criteria met, and those include the three with the, the universal association with death. And again, uh, the ICP greater than 30. 30 may not be the exact right number, but I think it would be a, 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 a robust variable to have available on, uh, on initial evaluation. But bilateral fixed pupils on arrival, involvement of deep nuclei or third ventricle, and an elevated uh, ICP. Secondary predictive criteria, each awarded two points for uh, each criteria met, mixed supra and infratentorial involvement, three or more lobes involved, adding a single lobe for cerebellar involvement and a transventricular trajectory, and then tertiary predictive criteria, one point for each criteria met by hemispheric involvement, systolic blood pressure less than 100 on arrival, and the presence of midline shift. We retrospectively went back and gave St. Louis um, scores, uh, St. Louis scale scores to our 48 patients. You'll see that there's a pr dramatic cutoff at four um, with a single patient uh, here with um, a St. Louis score of eight uh, surviving, although that one patient was one of the Glasgow outcome score of three uh, survivors. Um, the remainder of our survivors um, had, had, had quite good outcomes with uh, Glasgow outcome scores of three, uh, excuse me, f less than four. And uh, m most patients with, um, with Glasgow outcome, uh, excuse me, St. Louis scores greater than four went on to poor um, uh, 
recover, uh, went on to uh, succumb to their injuries. So here, four or more points per portends a particularly poor prognosis and maximal medical management versus comfort measures with consideration of organ donation may be appropriate for these patients. In conclusion, the pediatric population tends to demonstrate more favorable outcome following intracranial gunshot injury. Some patients may benefit from a more aggressive treatment paradigm than is currently considered in the adult population, and further research, including prospective validation of this scale as well as further delineation of the ICP cutoff um, point uh, to definitively establish this as a, as a treatment guideline, I think could help with further patient care. I'd like to thank um, research assistants Deanna Mercer and a very capable medical student, Jacob Greenberg, as well as Dr. Jeffrey Leonard and David Limbrick, pediatric neurosurgeons at St. Louis Children's Hospital for overseeing this project, and the trauma surgery services at Children's and Barnes for their administrative assistance. Thank you, thank you for that talk. Um, how did you validate the underlying assumption that all of these patients were treated with equal aggressiveness? You know, the, 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 the alternative is that this is something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If patients come in with bilateral fixed dilated pupils and don't get very aggressive treatment, of course they die. So how, did, how in your study did you validate what, what is a necessary underlying assumption that all of these patients were treated equally aggressively. I, I would have to say that we typically would look to the families for direction as far as um, aggressiveness of care on those what we would consider to be particularly poor grade patients on, on arrival and um, while Aggressive, you know, decompressive hemicraniectomies uh, would not necessarily be offered. I think probably uh, if there was a superficial clot that could be evacuated or, or, or some other um, uh, surgical intervention that we could offer the family as a, as a full, fully aggressive uh, intervention that would be offered to them. Um, but, but I would, um, I don't, I don't think we have a good way to validate that, but I would say that the historical treatment practice and, and by the neurosurgeons uh, that, over, that staffed these cases were that if the family wanted aggressive surgical intervention, that would be offered to the family. So that would be my best answer to that. Do you see the problem? I do. Thank you. This closes the pediatric session. Thanks for your patience and attention.